Okay, last week we almost finished up phosphorus chemistry and there's one last little slice of phosphorus chemistry that we have to cover and it's really one of the most important reactions as far as carbon-carbon bond forming reactions for phosphorus. Uh, and that's the Wittig reaction. I, I think everybody learns about this at some sort of undergraduate sophomore organic chemistry level. Uh, let me just remind you of what the Wittig reaction is all about. The idea behind the Wittig reaction is you take an aldehyde or a ketone, works best with aldehydes of course, uh, and then you add a phosphonium ilid. So ilid implying that there's some sort of a plus charge and a minus charge uh, th that are neighboring to each other. And this is a frustrated, frustrated system in ilid. Uh, because this is a third row atom, phosphorus, you don't, every single fiber of my being wants to take that lone pair and donate it into P plus, right? But you can't get really effective pi bond formation to a third row atom like phosphorus, so you end up with these really frustrated charges, so very reactive. And so this goes through a mechanism in which this attacks uh, the carbonyl carbon. And then kind of, at the same time, this oxygen is bending back around to form a bond to phosphorus. And that's the key bond forming step, the CC bond forming step of a Wittig reaction. And so you'll end up with a four-membered ring intermediate And don't freak out that there's five things attached to phosphorus, right? That's no big deal. Phosphorus can have five bonds. This is a, this phosphorus part of the molecule I would refer to as a phosphorane. <clears throat> and now this thing can fall apart in not exactly the same way as it came together. Now I have a choice for this, this top arrow here. I could make the electrons end on oxygen so that I have O minus or NP plus. I'm choosing to leave a PO double bond. Um, it's kind of an issue of choice, but remember we agreed that when we draw that PO double bond, we're, go we're all going to remember um, there's, there's really not a lot of pi character in that PO. That's not to say it's not a strong bond. Whether you draw it P plus O minus or P double bond O, that's a strong bond. So ultimately the important part here is that we get some sort of an olefin out of this reaction. And it doesn't have to be symmetric as I drew it. Usually R, the two R groups are different on your ilid and your carbonyl group. Okay, so um, in about a week and a half, we're going to start, maybe even uh, Friday, I think, we're going to start talking about pericyclic reactions. And this looks like something called a two plus two cycloaddition reaction. And we could describe it like that. And I'll get into that issue of nomenclature uh, in a little bit. The key point here is that this, uh, uh, this process right here is concerted. It's a concerted cycloaddition reaction. I'm not going to call it pericyclic. I'll reserve that terminology for something different. What I want to do is I want to look at the transition state here. And I don't know why, but I'm drawing this on its side now. I apologize for that. If you look at the transition state that's been found through ab initio calculations, like you're going to do, I don't think you'll do transition states next week, but we'll, we'll teach you how to do um, ab initio calculations. This is what the transition state looks like for this, this key carbon-carbon bond forming step. I'm trying to distort this as much as I can here. There's partial positive charge on phosphorus. That makes sense. There was, partial pos there was positive charge in the starting material. There's partial negative charge on oxygen. And, and in the transition state, as, it, as these two reagents get closer and closer and closer and you push these things together, you're going to go over this sort of energy hump. <clears throat> and in that transition state, what you'll find is, I didn't do a good job of this, but you've got about 44% of a carbon-carbon bond there. It's not quite the normal carbon-carbon bond length of one and a half angstroms. Um, it's getting there, it's still elongated. But at the point where you're really climbing over that hump, um, you've only got 44% of a carbon-carbon bond. In that transition state, <clears throat> you only have about 1% of a phosphorus oxygen bond. That oxygen bond is still far away from the phosphorus. But the point is there's some bond. And in the transition state the oxygen is not swung around to the other side of the molecule. The oxygen is trying to get close to the phosphorus. So the point is this is concerted. You don't have equal levels of bond formation between carbon, carbon and phosphorus oxygen in the transition state but it's still concerted. So we describe this as a concerted reaction. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Let's take a look at the next step, because the next step is also a concerted process. Both of these bonds fragment at the same time. So that's also concerted. Uh, but the, the rates for that elimination reaction depend on the functional group. So the identity of the, uh, I'll call this the R prime substituent here. The identity of the R prime substituent matters. So if R prime is an electron withdrawing group, then this goes below minus 20 degrees Celsius. So it's very fast to eliminate that PO. Really, P, the phosphorus wants this O minus attached to it. You want to end up with a PO double, some sort of phosphine oxide product. There's a huge driving force for that. And so as long as you have an electron withdrawing group there, um, this turns out to be a very fast process. If R is just a plain alkyl group, then it goes at, at faster than minus 20 degrees Celsius. Still below room temperature, but it, it, it's not quite as fast as if that's an electron withdrawing group. Okay, so the last key, I mean, really the only key thing is how do you get these illids? How do you end up with this situation where you have this C minus next to a P plus? And <clears throat> here's the way you make illids. You start off doing SN2 chemistry. And this is usually one of the biggest limitations uh, to, the, um, to the Wittig reaction. You have to have good substrates for SN2. You need to have aryl groups on your phosphine. If you have alkyl groups, then it won't know where to, pro to deprotonate when you try to pull off a proton. So you really need to have groups on here that you cannot deprotonate. Um, and phenyl is the most common one. And when you use phenyl, this is not very nucleophilic. So you have to have really good substrates. Iodo, actually iodomethane is the more common one. I'm not sure why I did this. So this room temperature, two days. Um, if you have secondary alkyl halides, that's really not an easy reaction. That would be extraordinary circumstances if you were trying to do SN2 uh, at a secondary center. So you typically will see things like primary alkyl halides. That's the common one. Methyl iodide, um, butyl iodide, or some sort of a tosylate. Okay, once you've done this, now you can't deprotonate the phenyl groups. There's no protons on the carbons here that, that are attached by phenyl. And so what that means is that when you treat this with however strong a base you want, and in order to get fast kinetics, um, you typically use butyl lithium for this. And what's ironic is that if you look at, at the pKa for this, it's only 18. You're using butyl lithium to get the fast rates. You could use a weaker base, but it would just be a slower reaction. And so when you do that, that's how you make an illid traditionally. You can use weaker bases, the, the anion of DMSO, we'll talk about that later today. Um, it's another common base for this reaction. And that's how you make a phosphonium illid, and now it's ready for you to do your, your Wittig reaction. Okay, so <clears throat> very frustrated, this P plus and C minus, and it makes that carbanion a great nucleophile. Okay, that's all for phosphorus chemistry, so now let's totally um, kind of shift over in the periodic table. Uh, we're only going to, uh, I hope and expect that you guys have already covered some silicon chemistry last quarter in Chemistry 201, Organic Reaction Mechanisms 1. Um, and so <clears throat> let's continue marching across this uh, third row of the periodic table. And I'll start by talking about electronegativities just to put things into context. Here's my little mini periodic table over here. Um, and just remember, as we march across the second row, all of these atoms are essentially the same size. Really, all that's changing is the amount of charge in the nucleus of each of these. So you have this monotonic increase in electronegativity, 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5. I can remember those, actually. I'm no good at remembering the third row, because it's not this simple ordering here. So when you go down to phosphorus, that's a significantly less electronegative than nitrogen. And when we look at sulfur, this is what we're going to talk about today, is sulfur chemistry. That's got about the same electronegativity as carbon. So you may want to think of this as an analog of oxygen, but it isn't in terms of electronegativity. And it's certainly not in terms of size. So we're going to take some time today getting used to this idea that sulfur is not like oxygen, 
Um, and SO double bonds are not like CO double bonds. So let's start off by talking about uh, nomenclature. So here are some common reagents that you've, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that all of you have used these kinds of reagents in the lab or eaten them when you go eat food. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start up here with the most oxidized sodium sulfate. Uh, it's a common salt that you would end up using in the lab. Um, <clears throat> there's another reagent that you often use in workups called sodium sulfite. And the key aspect of sodium sulfite is that there are lone pairs on oxygen and those lone pairs are nucleophilic. And you'll frequently take advantage of that in the lab when you do workups. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. So, well, I'll just show you now. Whenever you have some sort of leftovers in your reaction that have oxidizing or electrophilic potential, like iodine, I2, bromine, Br2, weak bonds, and you just want to wash it out of your reaction, you'll typically work those reactions up with some sort of a sulfite salt. Just an aqueous solution you keep on the shelf, you shake your organic solution, and it instantly cleaves all those weak bonds. So you get rid of the bromine, the iodine, or whatever. This is kind of basic, actually, solutions of sodium sulfite. You don't, usually you don't want to treat your organic molecules with solutions that contain hydroxide. So more frequently, people use a less basic solution of the monoprotonated version of this. It's half protonated. We call that bisulfite in the same way you say bicarbonate as the analog of, of carbonate anion. So sodium bisulfate is actually a much more common workup solution. Um, those aqueous solutions are less basic than the sodium sulfite. And you're using it for the same reason. You're using that to cleave bonds uh, to reactive reagents that are left over in your reaction mixture. The point is sulfur lone pairs are nucleophilic. Uh, so these are common reagents. Another common reagent you'll, you'll use during aqueous workups is you can't use sodium sulfate for any kind of a nucleophile. Lone pairs on oxygen on sulfate are not nucleophilic towards anything. That's the kind of counter ion you use when you don't want nucleophiles. But if you take one of these O minuses off and you replace that with an S minus, you totally change the character of this. So sodium thiosulfate has lone pairs that are screaming nucleophiles. I'm not going to draw one, I'll just draw E plus that attack things. So these are the common salts that you use uh, for aqueous solutions in the lab. Um, you know, these are good for cleaving oxygen-oxygen bonds, like the peroxide intermediates that spoil food. So you'll commonly see bisulfite or sulfite as an additive to fruits to preserve them or foods to preserve them. You're eating this all the time. If you look on the backs of the packages of the food you eat, uh, it's a common preservative that's used um, to keep food fresh. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about organic sulfur compounds. And it takes a little bit of time to adjust to this nomenclature. Uh, but you can see what I'm doing is I march across here as I ha I'm having fewer of these oxo groups attached to sulfur. So probably one of the most common or organic sulfur compounds would be a sulfonic acid, like peritoluene sulfonic acid. Right? What do you do in the lab if you want to use one milligram of sulfuric acid? You don't go fiddle around with the sulfuric acid bottle. What you do is you go get a bottle of solid sodium peritoluene sulfonic acid and you weigh out a milligram. That's a convenient way. So sulfonic acids are very commonly used uh, in the laboratory. Um, if you take off one of those oxo groups, you'll leave behind a lone pair. This is not so common, but you can still buy peritoluene sulfonic acid if you want. Um, <clears throat> just doesn't have those same advantages. And we'll talk about some chemistry of these sulfonate species later. And then here's a uh, an acid that you cannot buy anywhere. You can't even make that and isolate it in lab. It's called a sulfenic acid. You've never seen it. I don't think you've ever worked with it. And the problem is this is completely unstable. And we'll talk about why that's unstable and why you can't isolate those uh, shortly. That what's happening is that there's an increase in reactivity as we ta take away these oxoligands from the sulfur atom. So finally on the bottom, if we take away all these SO bonds or, or these substituents here and we have two alkyl groups on there, we call this a sulfone when you have two alkyl groups on sulfur. So it's an SO2, two oxo groups on sulfur. If there's a single oxo group and one low pair, we call that sulfoxide. So dimethyl sulfoxide is a very common, one of the most polar organic solvents that we've got. It's aprotic. And then finally, uh, we have just a, a, a Modern IUPAC nomenclature, we'd call that a thioether. Uh, but but you know, to keep it consistent here, we'll refer to that as a sulfide. So half the time people call them sulfides, the other half the time uh, people will refer to that as a thioether.
Okay, so these are the, the sort of nomenclature. You can see what's happening as we increase the, as we reduce the oxidation state of sulfur, as we go sulfonic, sulfinic, and then sulfenic. And as we do that, there's an increase in reactivity of sulfur and an increase in the number of lone pairs at sulfur. Okay, so let's walk through this. So this is dimethyl sulfoxide. And the main point I want to get across here is that it's, it's pyramidal. It's tetrahedral. So it's not some planar molecule like acetone. So even, though, even when you don't draw, I would recommend that you draw the lone pair in sulfur every single time. You never know when that's going to save your, your tail when you're working some sort of reaction mechanism. But even if you don't draw the lone pair, you have to remember that this is not a, a planar molecule. And the issue that we come to, just as we did with phosphorus chemistry, is which resonance structure should we draw? Should we draw it like this? And we make this big deal about how little pi character there is between a third row atom and a second row atom. And that's not to say that this bond is not strong, regardless of whether we draw it double bond O or O minus S plus. That's a strong bond either way. But the bottom line is, which of these is a better representation? And it becomes more confusing when I draw a sulfone. I think it's more obvious that this is um, pyramidal. This is dimethyl sulfone. Right? And if I want to draw both of these, if I, I, I want to honor the fact that there's not a lot of pi character in these bonds, I'm going to end up in this very uncomfortable situation of drawing a plus two formal charge on sulfur. And I think this is why I, I, I usually just give up and draw um, SO double bonds. <clears throat> but these are actually good resonance structures. In fact, if I want to understand the reactivity of a sulfoxide or a sulfone, I would draw these bottom resonance structures. Whenever I'm confused and I can't figure out what's going to happen, just draw the bottom resonance structures where you separate the charges and you'll have a much clearer picture of how these are going to react. Okay, but let me, um, I say you'll have a clearer picture. <clears throat> but let me give you a caveat on that. And the problem is seeing that S plus on sulfur when we draw these other resonance structures. <clears throat> so if I give you some sort of a carbocation, and of course this is totally different, and I put a plus charge here, it's irresistible that you want to attack that carbon. I would. Carbon wants an octet of electrons. And so when I draw something like this, who wouldn't immediately be attracted to that sulfur and want to attack it? But there is none of this electrophilic character here in this sulfur atom. Right? You'd have to do something extraordinary to make something want to attack that. There's no, there's no tendency for nucleophiles to, to come in and attack um, at that sulfur atom. That's not to say we couldn't change one of the R groups to a leaving group like chloride and then have a good antibonding orbital out the back end, but it's not because there's an S plus on sulfur or because sulfoxides or sulfones are, intri are intrinsically uh, uh, electrophilic. So don't treat sulfoxides or sulfone like carbocations. It's a totally different, um, totally different sort of a functional group. Okay, so let's talk a little more. Let's try to 
refine a little more our, our understanding of how to think about an SO double bond. I'm going to draw a series of molecules and a series of equilibria to help us understand this. And I want to start off by thinking about just positions of double bonds. If you were a double bond, here's two isomeric molecules for pentene. In one of these, the alkene is at the end of the molecule and in the other, the alkene is in the middle. And in sophomore organic chemistry, you learned that it is more stable for double bonds to be internal. Or the other way of expressing that is more substituted double bonds should be more stable if all else is equal. If you have the same numbers of carbons and, uh, and hydrogens, more substituted double bonds or molecules containing more substituted double, double bonds ought to be more stable. And that's true. And here's the, the equilibrium ratio for these two. It's about 97 to 3. It's over 2 kcals per mole difference in stability. If you're trying to think about, so why would that be? Well, you want to have some place for, for these donor type orbitals to donate into. The more CH bonds that you have next to pi star, the better donation you're going to get. And you just got more of that available to you when you have alkyl groups sticking off of the alkene. <clears throat> There's more of that opportunity. So if you want to just think about that in interaction of this bond with pi star. Um, but let's go ahead and just change this a little bit. And what I want to do is I want to imagine a different group here. And there's two different scenarios that we can think about as we change from a CH2 group here. Right? In other words, if that's a CH2 group and now we have an X group here, how much does that double bond want to be next to the X group? This will give us a chance to talk about conjugation. So I'll draw a, a little table here. And I've got two different isomers. I've got the non-conjugated isomer. So this is non-conjugated. And then over here I've got the, the isomer in which the double bond is conjugated with that X group. So we'll start off with the obvious one. And that is what happens if I replace that X group with a carbonyl? Let me draw the carbonyl going straight up and down because that's the way I drew the molecule. So if I replace that X group with a carbonyl group, I hope it's obvious to you that if I were a carbonyl group, I would want to be conjugated to that double bond. So this is in addition to this intrinsic preference. Double bonds want to be internal, but in addition, I would really like to be next to that carbonyl group if I were a double bond. Conjugation will lower the energy of molecules. And so when you do that, it should be no surprise that at equilibrium, you can't detect the, the non-conjugated one by techniques like NMR. There's so little, it, all of it wants to be conjugated. So if it's a carbonyl, and you allow it to equilibrate or epimerize or tautomerize, you expect the CO to want to be conjugated. Let's go ahead and replace, instead of having a CH2 group, what happens if we have sulfur there? This doesn't seem like such a profound surprise to me. Right? If I have a CH2, if I have a CH2 group here, you know, you, the double bond really wants to be internal. If I put an oxygen atom here, the double bond still wants to be internal. That's one of the ways you remove allyl ethers. You use rhodium to catalyze the isomerization. And it catalyzes the isomerization of the double bond. So you have a vinyl ether that's easy to hydrolyze off. If you put sulfur there, in sulfur the double bond wants to be internal. But here's what's ironic. If you replace that X with a sulfoxide, now it's worse. And it doesn't totally flip the balance. But you already know there's an intrinsic preference for double bonds to want to be internal. And in spite of the preference for double bonds to want to be internal, this starts to look not so good anymore. It's like the double bond does not want to be next to the sulfoxide. And it gets a little bit worse if I put a sulfone group there. So in spite of the intrinsic preference in this situation for the double bond to want to be internal, when you put a sulfone there, it really diminishes that preference. It diminishes the intrinsic preference. Allyl sulfones are, or if you had more substituents on here, double bonds don't want to be conjugated or next to sulfoxides or sulfones. There's an intrinsic preference to not do that. So it's not like don't think of this SO double bond in any way like a CO double bond. 
It's not. It's not the same. It's not the same kind of interaction. The double bond cannot conjugate with an SO double bond the way it can with a carbonyl group. So let's go ahead and look at the pKa's for the methyl groups that are next to acetone and next to the, the sulfoxide group and dimethyl sulfoxide. It's relatively easy to pull protons off of a ketone. So acetone has a pKa of 20, or ketones in general have pKa's around 20. If you take dimethyl sulfoxide, there is some uh, acidity there. It's not like propane. Right? You could, this is 15 orders of magnitude more acidic than propane, but it's not as acidic as a ketone. So <clears throat> let me go ahead and help you by, by seeing what happens as we march through this series of dimethyl sulfide, dimethyl sulfoxide, and dimethyl sulfone. There is an increase in acidity of these protons as we add more oxo groups on the sulfur atom. And so I'm going to draw, just so I, I like to see that anion there. If we deprotonate sulfoxides and we deprotonate sulfones, Right, if I take the proton off, I can't talk about pKa anymore. I have to say pKa prime, just to indicate that I've drawn the conjugate base. Um, but I'm just going to write the pKa values for the, for the original acid that was there. A sulfide is not much more acidic than just an alkane. It's about five, actually 100,000 times, five orders of magnitude more acidic. OK, so it's more acidic than a simple alkane, but not that much more. And so as I already showed you, when you put that oxo group on there, that really buys you a huge increase in acidity. So now we're talking 15 orders of magnitude more, um, more stable than just butylithium, for example. And when we add that second oxo group, um, you don't get another 10, full, 10 order of magnitude increase. That second oxo group wasn't as good as the first one was. But it still makes it more acidic. And you never get down to the acidity of acetone, right? It's never as good. Is having a double, is having an anion right here that can conjugate with the carbonyl. You just don't get effective conjugation um, when you put anions or double bonds or things um, next to sulfur like you do with a ketone, like you do with a carbonyl group. Okay, so let's come back to this sulfur thing. You do get some stabilization by being next to sulfur, which is a heteroatom. And people have and do continue to take advantage of that. Synthetically, here's the most common way to take advantage of that. <clears throat> I'm going to draw a, a functional group here called a dithiane. This is a fancy version of a thioacetal. So a dithiane, why, so why don't people call this a, di, a, thio, a, a dithioacetal? Because it's a six-membered ring, so that makes it a dithiane. So very specifically, when you have cyclic th dithioacetals that are part of a six-membered ring, we call that a dithiane. <clears throat> and so if you look at the pKa's for that proton, uh, it's the proton right here, the only proton that I drew. pKa is about 38 for that, which means you can pull that off with butylithium, and the rates happen to be fast enough to be useful. So it takes a very powerful base to deprotonate that at, at sufficiently rapid rates. But you can do it. Again, it's not like deprotonating a ketone. It's hard to deprotonate that. But once you do, you have a very powerful nucleophile. There's a second step to the arrow pushing. I'm not showing how you make the carbon-lithium bond, but you get the idea. And so now if you throw in whatever nucleophile of your choice, methyl iodide, benzyl bromide, allyl bromide, you can get SN2 reactions to occur. And that turns out to be a good nucleophile for SN2 reactions. This turns out to be a very common and powerful transformation for organic chemistry. And the reason is, you can hydrolyze this. And I don't want to trivialize this. It's not easy, actually, to get those sulfurs off of there. You can hydrolyze this back down to a ketone. And it allows you to do a transformation that you couldn't otherwise do. 
In other words, if you wanted to do some sort of a nucleophilic attack with a species like this, there's no such species. You can't deprotonate aldehydes and have acyl anions and then do use those for SN2 reactions. You can't make something like this. Um, and so you can use this as the equivalent of an acyl anion. If you kind of envision this to be the equivalent of a carbonyl group that can be deprotected at any point in time, this allows you to access the equivalent of a reagent that you normally couldn't get. So again, it's non-trivial to, um, uh, it's not trivial to deprotonate those. You'd have to use butylithium, but if you can do that, then this is a good reaction. You, you could never have guessed this. I'll show you there's a huge limitation, or maybe not so huge limitation here. You can't take just any cyclic dithioacetal and make this reaction work. So when you take a system like this and you treat this with butylithium, you get a significant amount of deprotonation over here. You would never have known that. There's nothing you could have known that would have allowed you to have predicted that. But you get a significant amount of deprotonation with the five-membered ring out here. And when you do that, this cleaves. This is the same reason why you don't store um, <clears throat> butylithium and THF. When you store butylithium and THF, it fragments in the same way. And so what you'll end up is you'll end up with this thiocarbonyl and a lithium e thioenolate um, out of that. And that just creates a huge mess. When half of your molecule gets deprotonated here, the other half is fragmenting to give thiocarbonyls and thioenolates. Uh, so if you want to do uh, dithiene chemistry, it has to be the six-membered ring. It can't be the five-membered ring. Remember the electronegativity of carbon and sulfur? They're the same. They're the same. If I took a ketone and I added butylithium, we all know what happens when you take alkylithiums and you add them to ketones. If I take a butylithium and I add it to this thiocarbonyl group, the butylithium attacks sulfur. Here, let me draw this butyl carbon bond. I wish I'd drawn it bigger so you get the idea. So if you this is just to make sure you don't confuse carbonyls with, uh, and I'll go ahead and draw the lithium attached here, right, in the second step, you capture lithium. Just to make sure you don't confuse thiocarbonyl groups with regular oxygen-based carbonyl groups, right, this is not at all the same. And then when you work this up, of course the proton is here. Now this is cheating a little bit. The phenyl groups provide some anion stabilization for the carbon-lithium bond. But still, if it were a carbonyl CO double bond, you would get 0% attack at oxygen, of course. So this is due to the fact that the sulfur has about the same electronegativity um, as the carbon atom. So if you take a, a sulfide or a thioether and you treat that with an oxidizing agent, in this case I'm going to take a peroxy acid as an example. <coughs> so peroxy acids have weak oxygen-oxygen bonds, sulfur attacks oxygen if you have a weak oxygen-oxygen. So it could be hydrogen peroxide, T-butyl hydroperoxide, peroxy acid, doesn't matter. You'll get virtually instantaneous oxidation um, to give a sulfoxide. It's so easy. To, if you leave sulfides out exposed to the air on your benchtop, you will get sulfoxides that slowly form over time. The important point here is that it stops here. You can make it stop here in high yield. In other words, even though there's another lone pair that's still there and is still nucleophilic, that second lone pair, once you put that first oxoligand on sulfur, this second oxidation is now slower. <clears throat> in other words, it doesn't the second you make this sulfoxide, it doesn't instantly further oxidize to give the sulfone. That only happens if you add a second equivalent of peroxy acid. 
So you can get this to stop. So in other words, these lone pairs here are more reactive than the one where you have an oxo group on the sulfur. So <clears throat> I'll just put a little line here and I'll say more reactive. And I think that's kind of obvious that if you put an electronegative oxo ligand on sulfur that that will diminish the reactivity of the lone pair. Uh, you could argue that there's a steric issue. <clears throat> Okay, but what about that sulfoxide lone pair and a CC double bond? If I compare the, the reactivity of these lone pairs with a pi bond, a carbon-carbon pi bond, no contest. Sulfur lone pairs are more no nucleophilic. Lone pairs are just more nucleophilic. I mean, it kind of makes sense. I'm going to take one example here where it's, it'll help us put things into context. If I treat this with two equivalents of MCPBA, peroxy acid, so weak oxygen-oxygen bond. I, I don't think there's any mystery here that the alkyne doesn't react. So what's amazing here is it's not just an alkene versus sulfur, it's a diene versus sulfur. Right? Dienes are more nucleophilic, the HOMO is higher in energy. <clears throat> MCPBA will still react faster with the sulfur. So sulfide lone pairs are more reactive even than dienes. There's still a lone pair on sulfur. The second equivalent of MCPBA still goes for the sulfur lone pair. So when it's sulfoxide lone pair versus a diene, the sulfoxide is still more re lone pair is still more reactive than a diene. So those lone pairs on sulfur are nucleophilic. Um, they attack stuff. And it's more reactive than, than typical alkene systems. That means there are, if you're carrying them through some big long synthesis, that, that can become a liability. That they're the most nucleophilic thing in the molecule. So let me go ahead and draw out this uh, This sulfoxide functional group. There's lone pairs on sulfur, there's lone pairs on oxygen. Sometimes the oxygen lone pairs react faster and sometimes the sulfur lone pair reacts faster. <clears throat> Generally you find that reactions that are dominated by charge, so electrophiles that are, have a lot of positive charge, a sodium ion for example. Are you surprised that the sodium ion prefers to, to coordinate with oxygen? I hope not. It's an electrostatic interaction there. So if you have some sort of a, a metal ion, an acid, proton transfer reactions, there's a lot of positive charge on the proton. Acid chlorides or bromides or acid iodides if you could get your hands on any of those. Silylation reactions, TMS chloride for example, all of those will react faster on oxygen. But if you take electrophiles that don't have a lot of positive charge, for example, methyl iodide, that will react faster on the sulfur atom of the sulfoxide. So things charge driven versus driven by the size uh, and, and low energy of the LUMO, so um, frontier orbital controlled reactions. Soft electrophiles, if you want to use this hard soft thing, which I'm not a fan of. Okay, so let's talk about the reaction of sulfoxide oxygens with electrophiles. And I'm going to home in on that, that acid chloride business. So if you have a thioether in your molecule, you can kind of think of this synthetically as the equivalent of an aldehyde. It's not hard to convert this into an aldehyde functional group and to do that you use something called a Pummer reaction. And so this, the secret recipe for a Pummer reaction uh, looks like you're about to acetylate an alcohol. It's acetic anhydride and pyridine. And what you get out of that is not actually an aldehyde but you get something that's easily converted into an aldehyde. You get, a thio, you get a thioacetal functional group. If you use sodium hydroxide to cleave this ester, the O minus pushes out 
the thylate anion. So it's very easy to cleave esters like this and then push out the thylate anion that's spontaneous. So that's the equivalent of an aldehyde functional group. So, so how does this work? The way it works is you first have to convert this to a sulfoxide. And like I said, anything can do that. Hydrogen peroxide, air if you let it go long enough, MCPBA, iodine and water. I mean, it's easy to oxidize thioethers to sulfoxides. Once, you've do, once you do that, when you treat this with acetic anhydride, and I'm not going to show all the arrow pushing, you acetylate that oxygen. Right? It's kind of like S plus O minus. So let me draw that intermediate. Maybe I should have drawn that S plus and O minus so you can more easily see. But you go through this intermediate. I, I can't resist drawing the lone pair. I'm sorry. It's like irresistible for me to do that. Even though it's not really relevant at, yet at this stage. I just want to see that lone pair or else I'll freak out. Okay, so you go through this intermediate here. It looks like a sulfonium ion. I would refer to this as, an, as a sulfonium, even though that's not an R group right there. <clears throat> and here's where the pyridine comes in. This can now do, and you could argue about whether this is an E2 elimination concerted or whether it's an E1CB mechanism. Bottom line is that you can easily pull this proton off and then you lose the acetate. I'll draw this as a two-step elimination process. I'm not even sure if I've got the right number of alkyl groups in my chain here, but. So in a way, this is like a carbocation that's stabilized by a, a sulfur group. <clears throat> you could call this a thiocarbenium ion if you wanted to be really picky. And now if you have acetate anion floating around in this reaction, it can come in an attack. And that's what gives you your, your uh, thioacetal product in this reaction. Okay, that's a Pummer reaction. So it takes advantage of the fact that sulfoxide oxygens um, react quickly with uh, electrophiles. They react quickly with acid chlorides, silohalides, <clears throat> acid anhydrides. And um, let me come back and mention something over here that I forgot to mention. And I, what I want to do is I want to compare the basicity of various different oxygens. If I look at the pKa's for these various different protonated species, it tells me how basic that double bond to oxygen is. And I think this comparison will help, help us to see um, the relative basicities uh, of a sulfoxide oxygen versus a regular carbonyl group. So if you look at the pK for a, it's not easy to protonate a carbonyl group like a ketone. Typically when you do reactions with carbonyls, you add toluene sulfonic acid or sulfuric acid. You just don't add lame acids to those or, or if you do, you have to use high concentrations of those acids. The pKa <clears throat> prime for these species, minus seven, right? That's kind of on the order of sulfuric acid. That oxygen does not want a proton because the lone pairs are busy stabilizing this, this carbocation like carbon. It's not that much different from um, uh, for a protonated ester. Right? It's not even an order of magnitude different. And there is some sort of a resonance donation here that might make this a little more basic, but the downside is that you've attached an electronegative oxygen atom. Now when I look at, at, at the basicity of sulfoxide lone pairs, now it's five orders of magnitude off from a regular carbonyl. So sulfoxide oxygens are about 100,000 times more basic uh, than, than regular carbonyl oxygens. About 100,000 times more basic. And I forgot to mention that to help you kind of get a sense for the reactivity of this oxygen on a sulfoxide. <coughs> okay, let's come back to this uh, issue of um, of sulfur lone pairs as nucleophiles. So if you just take a simple thioether, 
They're very good at SN2 reactions if you have hot electrophiles. So if I take allyl bromide, that's a great electrophile for SN2. That'll make a sulfonium ion. And you'll have this bromide counter ion floating around. These reactions are actually reversible because at the same time that sulfur is good at, at attacking, it's also easier for the bromide to come back in and pop off the allyl species. But one thing you have to be careful with is if you have exchangeable groups here that are also easy to do SN2 attack, you'll see kind of a metathesis process occurring where the bromide comes back in and can pop off different groups than the one that just came back in. This whole system can exchange um, and you usually don't want that to happen. Right now you have benzyl bromide floating around in the reaction and then the benzyl bromide can come in and react with your other starting material and you get this whole exchange of the alkyl groups and sulfur. Usually that's not what you want so I hope that doesn't happen uh, to you. Let me come back to this reactivity of sulfoxide lone pairs. When you oxidize sulfides to sulfoxides that second oxidation is not as fast as the first. So when you put that oxo ligand on sulfur, the lone pairs here are less reactive than a regular sulfide. So you can get this lone pair to, to react through SN2 reactions. So in other words, if you take methyl iodide and you put it in DMSO, you can get the lone pairs on, on I mean the lone pairs on, on the sulfoxide. Sulfur will attack, but it's slower. So now, to, instead of a reaction that occurs at room temperature, you have to heat these for an extended period in order to get sufficient reaction rates. So it's slower than just a regular sulfide. A species you get in this case is called a sulfoxonium ion. I'll just put that name there. This is called a sulfoxonium. Whereas this species up here is called a sulfonium. That's a piece of nomenclature that I didn't mention before. Okay, so just like if you have oxygen with three bonds to it, that's called an oxonium. Sulfur with three bonds, sulfonium. And I think you, you can see why that's called a sulfoxonium ion. Okay, so, um, wow, we didn't, we're, we'll probably come back on Friday and finish up talking about sulfur chemistry. Uh, so we still have some more to cover in order to understand sulfur. So uh, uh, we'll do that on Friday.